once again. Good morning. Trust the Lord's been good to us this week, sustained us, supplied our need. Before we begin, I should like to pray one more time for the sermon and for our message this morning. So if you will, pray with me. Lord, we are grateful indeed for your movement throughout history. We are grateful, Lord, that now on this side of the Reformation, Lord, we can see that truly salvation is a work from beginning to end, done solely by you. Lord, we pray that uh, even as some things this morning may come across dry, Lord, that you would, uh, Lord, give me the uh, ability to preach them well, and as may some things may seem cliche even, Lord. We're Christians. We've heard a lot of stuff over and over again, Lord. May the things we hear, Lord, and the things preached not be dull to us, Lord. We pray that you'd be glorified and, um, Lord, worshiped this morning through uh, the preaching of uh, your word and just examining uh, history and where we've come. Amen. Now, we will make it to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, I promise. Um, when I was preparing this sermon, I was, I was thinking of ways to shorten this intro, and truth be told, it is a bit of a long intro, and I, don't, I could not find a way around it. Uh, so please bear with me, and we will get to Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. Uh, but if you've been part of our church or you're not sure why we call ourselves a Reformed church, hopefully the first part of this sermon will give you insight as to, well, why we call ourselves a Reformed church and, um, well, what the Reformation was, um, as well as what that means for us today. Now, for those that, you know, probably already have an idea, some of us, I know a lot of the men, we talk theology, um, Maybe for some of us, this is just a piece of history. This is something that has happened in the past. Uh, now we're on this side of it, but it's kind of old news. Um, or maybe you've heard it a million times, um, but hopefully we can change that perspective this morning. Um, and I'll just tell you from the outset, we've said the Reformation is not over, so it, it's a bit of a spoiler alert. Guess what, guys? The Reformation is not over. Uh, so I guess for some of us, this will be a bit of a refresh. Uh, but when we think of the Reformation, for some of us, a lot of names might come to mind. John Calvin, right? John Knox. I, I'm a fan of John Knox. Just saying. Uh, or Ulrich Zwingli. Um, I know Martin's read some stuff from him that is absolutely amazing. Um, but most notably of them all would be Martin Luther. In short, he was an Augustinian monk. He was a professor, a theologian. Um, and when I was looking stuff up on the internet, he was the seminal figure of the Reformation. Uh, he also translated the Bible into German, which would have been a big deal. Um, people with a common language would have been able to then read their Bible. In short, what was the Reformation? And Martin kind of touched on this this morning. He's stealing my notes, I think. Uh, essentially, it was a return to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not that it was lost, but um, truly through years of tradition have been distorted. You might call it a religious revolution that started in the 16th century. It did change the course of history. It is why we have our Western civilization today. Thank you, Martin, for touching on that one, too. <laughs> why America as a nation exists and why we are sitting here this morning and we call ourselves a Reformed Church. This started in 1517, when Martin Luther published, nailed or pinned, there's a debate over this, uh, what we call the 95 Theses on the All Saints Door of Wittenberg. And like I said, there is speculation as to whether they were actually nailed. It's certainly possible. Um, it's also possible they were simply pinned. Um, we do know that they were, though, mailed to Archbishop Albrecht of Mainz on October 31st, which is why we have our Reformation Day on October 31st. Now, these 95 theses essentially just would have been questions, debate questions, propositions for debate, and the All Saints Door was uh, a bit of a bulletin board, or maybe we would call it this day a Twitter of sorts, or an X, formerly known as Twitter. Um, now, we do know that these were sent to Albrecht of Mainz because he was irritated with the teachings of another person. And this would have been Johann Tetzel, and we'll speak more regarding Johann Tetzel in a bit, but um, 
It was in regards to indulgences for forgiveness of sins. This will be very important for us this morning. This is what would have provoked Martin Luther to post these debate questions for discussion. And at the time, there were definitely power struggles between church and state. There were socioeconomic conditions. There were very poor being taken advantage of by the wealthy and by the church for the purpose of fundraising. And I'll touch more on that in a bit. But essentially, he believed that church institutions and the people had been corrupted and needed to be reformed or renewed or cleansed of its impurities. So what were the errors? What were the reasons for posting these debate questions? Indulgences I've touched on, as well as purgatory. Essentially, indulgences at the time were a particularly well-known method of exploitation. And it was the selling of indulgences, a monetary payment of penalty, supposedly absolved one of their past sins or released maybe a loved one from purgatory. And depending on where you were in the social classes, they would cost different amounts, right? So you could be wealthy, so therefore you'd pay a higher amount. Poor people would pay less. It sounds a lot like our taxes today. But if you pay, then you're given a paper or something that said you had withdrawn from a treasury of merit. All right, what is the treasury of merit? All right, sorry guys, I told you, this first part, it's going to be a little bit. Uh, essentially, it was the idea of this, guys. Christ's blood, one drop of it, was absolutely enough to save the entire world. And yet, Christ bled copious amounts of blood. Therefore, there would have been a sort of savings account of merit because he bled so much. There was all this excess merit because it only took one drop to save the world. Now with the Roman system, also Mary's merit was also in that treasury as well. So if you were a sinner and you needed merit, what could you do? You could buy it. Someone you love was in purgatory. Well, essentially, you could buy them out. So what is purgatory? Essentially, in short, it's just a, a place where uh, the dead would be I guess, tormented or maybe purged of their sins before gaining access to actual heaven, right? It was a place where <clears throat> you had to go to essentially pay for sins that you died in that had not been uh, absolved. So you would need this over and over again, essentially, because you sinned over and or over again. In other words, the Christ, Christ's work on the cross was never a finished work in that Roman system. And indulgences at the time basically became a fundraiser for what we now know as St. Peter's Basilica, so Johann Tetzel was a priest, I told you I'd be touch on him again, who sold indulgences for building St. Peter's Basilica in Rome. And he used slogans such as, and I know we've heard this before, as soon as a coin in the coffer rings, the soul from purgatory springs. If I was to sum that up, essentially those with power can save you if you give them money. Sounds a lot like our climate change religions of today. Just give us money, we'll save the world. Now, Martin's view on this, uh, and I'm quoting him here, is, My humble supplication to your electoral grace is, therefore, that your electoral grace refrain from leading the poor people astray and from robbing them and present yourself as a bishop and not as a wolf. Gotta love Martin's language. He was very to the point. It is sufficiently well known that indulgences are nothing else but canavery and fraud that Christ alone should be preached to the people. In short, he's basically saying that they cannot save you. You're stealing their money, and you're not saving them. Preach Christ to them. This brings us essentially to like the big question of the Reformation, and that is justification. And uh, forgive me here, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read something, and I forgot to cite the quote. So if you're out there and you wrote this, my apologies. I'm not trying to steal it. It's not mine. The Roman view of the gospel, as expressed at Trent, was that justification is accomplished through sacraments. Right? We've talked about baptism. We've talked about uh, purgatory. We've well, that's not a sacrament, but we've talked about paying indulgences. There was a system, Right? So, was that justification is accomplished through the sacraments. Initially, the recipient must accept and cooperate in baptism, by which he receives justifying grace. He retains that grace, 
until uh, he commits a mortal sin. Mortal sin is called mortal because it kills the grace of justification. The sinner then must be justified a second time. And that happens through the sacrament of penance, which the Council of Trent defined as a second plank of justification for those who have made shipwreck of their soul. So you see, justification essentially has then depended on a person's sanctification in the Roman system. So indeed, Luther did create a strong idea of justification by faith that rejected the notion of purgatory as unbiblical. He argued that indulgences and their system cannot lead to salvation. And essentially, he went, he went against the authority of the Pope. So his criticism of the church was because of his commitment to Christ in the scriptures, though. It wasn't just for the sake of being contrarian, right? And at the outset, he was not planning on starting any kind of reformation. Oftentimes, we look back at history and we think he is the, he is the founder of this massive revolution. But I'm telling you now, he could not have known that. He simply was just trying to post debate questions to a rival professor at a rival college in the next town. Now let's remember, indulgences are tied to sanctification, which the Roman Catholics have tied directly to one's justification. So again, back to it. This is the big question. And we've all heard this, and this is the more correct way, which is justification is that forensic or legal term that basically says that we are now right before God. We're in right standing before our Father. And what Luther developed and what we believe today is that we are justified apart from works that could merit that justification. Good works apart from faith are dead, so we are justified by faith. And if justified, then we are saved. So what does the scripture then say about how we are saved? And this brings us finally to Ephesians. Thank you for letting me speed through that. Um, Ephesians 2, 8 through 10 is our reading for this morning. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. It makes you wonder when you read this, how could they have stray, uh, strayed so far from God's truth? You see, we had for hundreds of years people striving through tradition to attain merit. But here it is clear as day, church. Even the faith that you have this morning is not a faith that you willed unto yourself, but it is a faith that the Lord has given you, which is why it says it is not of your own doing. This is where we get the idea from the Reformation that it is in Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. We read elsewhere that there is one name under heaven by which men are saved, and that is Christ Jesus. Church, it is not through uh, paying indulgences. It is not through Mary's merit. It is not through the sacraments. It is because God's grace in sending his own son was that atoning sacrifice, which the scripture also says, once for all time delivered. Not for all men, for all time. If you are justified, you are justified for all time. That undeserved favor and love of God towards his enemies. I cannot say that I have loved my enemies the way the Lord has. This is where he takes that person that was once in enmity from that state of enmity and calls him friend and gives him that favor. Fully saved, fully pardoned, and obtaining that richness and joy in salvation. And that is important. Where would one find their joy if they are constantly seeking to find merit and find some form of forgiveness outside of Christ. You see, the forgiveness and the justification that we have in Christ is not a temporal state. If you are in Christ, this is a completed work. This is an eternal state of the soul, secured. You see, they were once in darkness working to obtain something they could never obtain. We know this now. 
that it is grace alone that gives us the faith to believe in our beloved Savior. It's God's gift. You see, church, if you are sitting here this morning and you have faith, it is because the Lord has animated your soul. Your heart would still be in that stony state it was before faith came into your heart through grace. Saved from the punishment of death in this life and eternal wrath and torture that we know deep down, the church we truly deserve. Verse 9, not as a result of works so that no one may boast, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. I know we've heard this a million times, and I hate it that sometimes we read scripture and we think, man, I've heard that, I know that. And it sounds cliche, but it shouldn't. This is literally what happened in the world. In the Roman system, you would be constantly in fear for your soul. If I die tomorrow, if I die tonight, did I pray enough? Did I pay enough? Did I die in the right soul state to actually merit heaven? Or will I be purged of my sins in purgatory? Did I do enough? It sounds, again, I hate to, uh, to bring this to now, but it sounds like the woke religions of today, and this is a funny thing, it's, it's weird. The, the religions of men have not changed uh, over the millennium, have they? But what is miraculous about our gospel is that it flies in the face of all the man-made religions is that God would give himself for his own people to save them. The Roman system said, what are you going to do to be saved? What are you going to do to be justified? Ah, but we're on this side. What has Christ done so that we can be justified? How could you know you were truly saved? You would work, you'd pay those indulgences, pray to saints? Or in Luther's case, he would beat his body. But thankfully, not only is salvation all of God, but the works we do as Christians have been prepared beforehand, church. And this was the power of the gospel that changed the world. So don't let the fact that you've heard it a million times cause your ears to be dulled, your heart and your mind to grow dulled to this amazing glory. I pray the Lord renews that in us this morning, stirs it within our hearts to understand the amazing glory and the, the, the blessing that it is to live on this side of that history. Romans 11.6, how about this? But if by grace, it's no longer on the basis of works. Otherwise, grace would no longer be grace. You see, if it is by grace through faith, then it can no way be tied to your striving after it, church. Rest. As far as I can tell, this is the nail in that Roman coffin. Or how about this one? I touched on this earlier. Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no under no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. Can scripture be more clear? There isn't another name. It is not Mary, it is not a saint, it is not a pope, it's not a work. It's not a price that you have to pay. Praise God, the price has been paid. You see, all of salvation is that work of God, not indulgence or sacraments, not confessions to priests or Hail Marys. It's not any good work. The grounds to boast in self through what I've just read to you has been obliterated on the cross of Christ. We don't work to obtain. And this is something I've heard Martin say over and over again, but we work, church, from rest. It's not that we don't work. We work from rest knowing that Christ's work has been completed and the works that we do have been prepared by our Savior beforehand. It is from duty to delight, he has said, because Christ already attained it. Salvation secured. There is no striving that you can do this morning to attain it. So the Reformation, it gave way to the Christian West This is our heritage. This is our family tree. This is, as a Protestant church, this is our lineage. And assuming it's not the heretical churches, 
But if you're part of a Protestant church, that is your heritage. We exist because the Lord did this work in history. So like I said at the beginning, often we think of the Reformation as something that history um, is in history past or something that is done and we've benefited from it. And that's, that's true to a degree. And when we look around, it would seem as though it really has, the flame of that Reformation really has gone out. Wars, right? It seems our nation is in quite the upheaval. Ukraine, right? Israel, all the things going on in the world. It can seem dark. It can seem hopeless for sure. Let us read Philippians 1, 6, and we'll get to why this is relevant. Not only in ourselves, but to the rest of the world. And I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. As sure as we sit here this morning, I'm I'm sure we don't doubt God's ability to keep his promises and indeed complete the work of sanctification in us to get us to the end, to run the race well. Sadly, many churches in America today, looking out at the cultural and political landscape, we can't help us, they can't help us say such thing as, we don't win down here. I'm sure we've all heard that one. They essentially say, come join our team, we're going to lose. Not a, not a great motto. Uh, but church, be assured he will complete his good work in you. And in thus doing, he will complete that work which he promised in his prayer of bringing heaven to earth, renewing the earth. How? By raising up generations of faithful men and women who by God's grace will also raise up little children in the fear and admonition of the Lord. So you see, the flame is not out. It may seem like glowing, just glowing coals right now because of what's going on, but we don't do our theology looking out at the world. We start in God's word. And this is the challenge before us today. So why does the Reformation still matter? Because the gospel still matters. Because the gospel will always matter. Because we are still sinners who need that gospel daily. And so long as the religions of the world, secular or otherwise, are seeking to distort that gospel, seeking to disrupt your peace and security in Christ, Or how about this, so long as churches are softening the edges of it so they can seem relevant or inclusive to a a fallen world, we will need that gospel, and the Reformation still matters, and therefore the Reformation is still not over. See, the gospel presses on, and it must press on because the nations will come to Christ. For every generation born that, well, there are sinners being born, guess what? There are generations of people that need that good news. And so long as we are a church here at Christ Redeemer, by God's grace, let us be that beacon of light to a darkened world around us. Martin Luther said that the gospel must be defended in every generation. And church, again, though that may seem like it is low right now, it is time to recognize that the flame of the Reformation lives on. In Geneva, there was a motto And it went like this, post tenebras lux. After darkness, light. Just as the world and the church prior to the Reformation was in darkness, when the light of the Reformation made its way to Geneva, it awakened the souls of the people. Clearly, it awakened a nation. And just as we, church, this morning were once in darkness, the light of the gospel awakened us. It animated us from nothing to faith, from death to life. Quoting John Calvin here, God not only protects and defends the kingdom of Christ, but also extends its boundaries far and wide and then preserves and carries it forward in in uninterrupted progression to eternity. We must not judge of its stability from the present appearances of things, right? But from the promise which assures us of its continuance and of its continued or rather constant increase. 
See, just as our salvation is not dependent on our own doing, unlike that Roman system, it is the finished work on the cross in God who keeps his covenant. So Christ's kingdom on earth will increase and his government will know no end and what must have looked like a mustard seed surely is growing into a giant tree. And just by way of application, as we start to figure out, well, what does this really mean for me today? What do we ask? Where does it start? Church, if we want to build that culture, and I know so many of us are about building that culture, it starts with self. (laughs) It starts with men and women in their homes daily reforming themselves. Protecting the gospel and preaching it to themselves daily and to their families. Men, are you preaching that word to yourself every day? Do you think you need that gospel every day when you wake up? And then are you preaching that to your family? Drawing from it and God's promises uh, that animating hope and faith daily. This is something I know we all struggle with time to time and we go through seasons, but the gospel must be that well that we go back to for our nourishment. But it's going to take courage in the face of a world system that is calling falsehood truth in truth falsehood. But that's exactly what Luther had. Steve Lawson says Luther was one man against a thousand years of dead tradition. It's going to take courage. And if you are a man who struggles with courage, have you prayed for it? Do you believe that God can actually supply and strengthen you for that daily fight? It will start with courage of self. You need to open that word. You need to preach the gospel because you need it daily. But it's going to take courage. To read the stories of men who have gone before us courageously in the faith, part of our family tree, that lineage, and then count the cost. Consider this. If you do not find that courage, if you are not praying for it, if you are not ready to defend the gospel in and out of season, what will the consequences and the cost of that be? Martin had the courage to question the church, to stare down death, ultimately in order to be faithful to God. Right? We've said it a lot in this church, but we fear God more than we fear men, and that's certainly true in Martin's case. And it might look different today than it did for him, but it still applies. For us, it might look a little more simple. Today, having courage... uh, and being faithful might be as simple as an ordinary man, you know, working an ordinary job, coming home to his ordinary family, but giving them the extraordinary gospel, raising kids to believe in the God of Scripture. Courage might simply just be believing in a face of world that a face of a world that says you are a bigot for believing this. So we'll need to be faithful, church to God's word above all else, and fear him above all things. Now, there's something else important. This is kind of the last thing I'll be touching on this morning, but that is the importance of legacy. This is something that really didn't hit me, honestly, until I started having kids. Uh, Just kind of live for the day, I think, as, as many of us did before children. But it wasn't until after kids that I started understanding the importance of, well, where did I come from as a lodge, right? Where am I taking that future? Where, where are the lodges going to be in 500 years? Legacies, vital. We have an Old Testament full of legacies. See, we are at a Reformed church. By God's grace, then, we are downstream of our fathers in the faith. Something to consider here with the commandment to honor your father and mother, but that is this, is that beyond our actual father and mother, my dad, my mom, we have fathers in the faith, and they too must be honored. They are our part of our legacy. We are in their family tree. And now we carry that torch 
into the future. By God's grace, then, this is the idea that we will build that future that we want our children and our grandchildren to inherit. If there's encouragement here this morning, church, certainly it is this, is that uh, if we are to bring it full circle back on justification, is that though the world may condemn you for your faith, call you a bigot, you know, get with the agenda, you know, just give in a little, just soften, compromise. Maybe you're not doing enough, you know? Or they tell you that you need to save yourself somehow, right? All the man's religions, like I said, they haven't changed for thousands of years. They're all telling you the same thing. Save yourself. Church, if you don't have peace this morning, there is peace found. There is rest found at the foot of the cross. That justification that they once strived so much for is only found in the completed eternal work of Christ on the cross. That once for all justifying work of our victorious king. Lastly, we have faith that God will complete that good work, right? If he's working in us, it can't help but be worked out in the rest of the world because of that. So, because he began that work in us, without fail, he will complete it. And in so doing, continue reforming this world through his people. Let us pray. Lord, we are indeed grateful that you are a God who, um, Lord, uh, condescended to men to save through no merit of our own, Lord, but by your grace, because you first loved us, Lord, we can now love you. Lord, please continue to bless our church here. May we grow stronger, uh, Lord, in Christ. May our gaze be eternally fixed on Christ, Lord, no matter what is going on outside of these walls. Lord, we don't do our theology by looking outward in, Lord. We start with your word first. Lord, though, so it may be dark, Lord, your promises endure, and you are a God who is a covenant-keeping God, Lord. You will not fail. Lord, give us courage this morning. Lord, give us faith to fight daily, Lord, for ourselves, for our families, and for the cause of Christ. Amen.